everyone as we join together today to continue through Colossians. Uh, and we'll give a chance for everybody to get their get their Bible opened up. Um, but one we'll start as always with prayer and we have a number of people that I'll just raise up in prayer, um, part of our group and other people in our community who are sick. So I'll also give a chance for anybody that you want to bring to prayer as well. So we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm-hmm. Lord, we turn to you this afternoon and we give you thanks that you have gathered each one of us here to be in your presence and to delve into your most holy word. Help us to be open and attentive to all that you wish to say to us this day. We raise up also all those who are not with us for various reasons, especially those who are sick and who are in need of continued recovery, that you might bless them with all that they need to strengthen them and to comfort them. And we pray for our parish community, especially all of those who are beginning studies during these days. Some of our members who are now in classes at this hour, we pray for your blessings upon them as well. And we pause for a moment if there's any intentions that you all would like to bring before the Lord and raise up to him this day. Lord God, draw near to us, draw near to these intentions that we voice and those kept in our hearts. We ask this in all things through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. So let's continue on here. Um, Just a little review. It's interesting that I'm sitting now. I've been standing the whole time now I'm sitting. It's it's a wholly different, it's a very different vibe. Yeah. Somebody decided to put a table out and now it's a totally different vibe. So it's kind of nice. Yeah. It's one of those things where you don't, you know, the whole year I never thought about, oh, I could just sit down if I wanted to. That's nice. So, um, so yeah, we're continuing through Colossians. Just a little, little review. We're in. Colossians 1, 15 through 20 is a hymn. Remember we talked about last time, it's a hymn that Paul, not that Paul wrote, but a hymn that Paul cites. So it probably was a hymn that was very familiar to the Colossian people. And so Paul cites it as a way of saying, remember what you say in this hymn? You know, this is something that's important for us to reflect on now. And we talked a little bit too about how hymns that we sing, you know, in church usually have a, a lot of, uh, theological kind of depth to them. There's a lot there that if you reflect on the words of the hymn, you say, oh, this is really a summary of what we believe. So this uh, hymn that he cites is really a summary of what we as Christians believe. The Colossians believe, but we believe as well. Um, so we started with verse 15, and then we'll just enter into the rest of the verses. But we started last time. We had a lo- long discussion last time on 15. He, meaning Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, For in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So we talked last time about how this is the first thing that's said in this hymn, right? How um, all things were created through the Son, the second person of the Trinity. We had that nice little diversion into theology, which is fun, but um, the second person of the Trinity, meaning the Son, Son of God who takes on flesh in Jesus Christ. Through him, all things were created, the visible and the invisible. We didn't really talk about that last time, but think about that, you know, we believe that as well, that as Christians, right, and we say this in the creed, that there's a visible reality that we see, obviously, the physical reality, but obviously we also believe in invisible reality. And when he's saying here, thrones or dominions or principalities, authorities, what do you think he's talking about with that? Exactly. All the, the the choirs of the different ranks of angels. We say this in the um, in the holy holy, right? Or, and also in the preface, when we say, you know, uh, and therefore with all the angels and the thrones and dominions and hosts, and we say, holy, holy, holy. You know, um, so what we're saying in the mass is this invisible group of angels, millions of angels that are arrayed in different ranks, are constantly. The only thing they're pretty much doing is they're helping us, but they're also just singing praises to God, basically, for eternity. So we're joining our voices in praising them. So Paul is saying here how, uh, obviously, it's through Christ that all things are created that we see, but also the invisible realities, too. Um, The angels, even the fallen angels, right, the demons, they were also created, obviously, in the beginning through Christ, and then they obviously fell away um, at a certain point. But So all things were created through him and for him. This is something we didn't talk about last time, but just a question that maybe we could think about. You know, why is it important 
to stress this point? You know, why is it important for Paul to have to say and for this hymn to have to say all things were created through, you know, by God through Christ? Seems like it's something that's so uh, second nature to us as Christians, but why would it be so important for Paul to have to reiterate this? And this actually gets into some of the things about the letter. Sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Yes. That's an excellent point. Sharon, right, is your name? Excellent point. Excellent point. So, um, yeah, it's a great point. So many of the Colossians, remember we talked about this in some of the other letters that in some cases a lot more like Jews who became Christian. In this case, it's more pagans. And so why would it be important? Like, do we know anything about kind of pagan ideas about creation and all that kind of stuff? Reality? Maybe Sharon does or other people. Mm. Uh, uh, I guess they, they parallel one another, but the, but the sources are, are different. Yes. Yeah, the Epic of Gilgamesh, that's a good point. And actually, the Epic of Gilgamesh, if you go back to pretty much all of, so that would be obviously a pagan source, but any of the pagan sources that talk about the beginning of things, right? Pretty much all of them, they have different ways of saying it, but pretty much all of them um, don't have anything in the sense of creation, what we call creation ex nihilo which just means in Latin, creation out of nothing. Like that was something that the, the Jewish people believed in, obviously, if you go back to Genesis, right? God creates out of nothing. But that was actually very, it seems strange for us today because we just think that, you know, today, especially if you believe in the Big Bang and all that kind of stuff. But back then, it was not considered, you know, a, a common belief. So they would have thought that basically matter and, and creation and the physical reality just basically was eternal. It just existed from all time. And God or the gods sort of just are suffused within creation through all eternity. So the idea of there being a creation out of nothing would have been totally, you know, totally crazy for them. They would have said, this is ridiculous, you know. Um, and also it shows the power of God, right? That God is all powerful, that he's so powerful, God is, that he can actually bring things into being that didn't exist. Well, it would be because as pagans, they had many different gods mm -hmm. that had hands in creation. Mm -hmm. So is Paul stressing that there's just one true God and things were created through him, not all these exactly. various deities? Yes. That's exactly why I think he's stressing, because he stresses two things, right? So he's stressing first that God, you know, the Father creates all things, but he's also stressing, and it's through, only through, mediation is only through the Son. And that kind of goes to your point about saying it's not through all these other, you know, various, like the, the God of the water and the God of the air and the God of this. And the other thing, too, if you think about people have read, like, you know, the Iliad or the Odyssey or some of these, like, Greek, you know, you know stories, like, when they talk about gods, you know, or if you see movies about this, you know, with Aphrodite and, you know, Hermes and Apollo, right? There's a sense that gods, the gods are very much, they're sort of like human beings, but they're just like a little bit more powerful, basically. So they're sort of like humans, but just a little bit more powerful version and everything. So there was this kind of more like what we would say anthropomorphic idea of the gods where they're kind of closer to to humanity and and um, they're not really that, you know, they, they're not really po all powerful over creation because they're kind of have their own problems too, right? So this is, again, what's so different about the Jewish and the Christian faith is that God is like other than creation. Like God is not part of creation. God is other than creation, and he actually creates all things, right? So he, pagans, back in our time, mm -hmm. they just kind of made these stories up and believed them about these different gods and stuff. Yeah, so they had, yeah, so... It, Pretty much all these different cultures, even cultures in the New World, like the Mayans, the Aztecs, right, pretty much all created their own myths about how they came to, usually it was a myth about how they came to be, right, like how the people came to be. And so usually that also involves pretty much all across the board. Every single ancient culture has ideas about God or gods, you know. Most of them were polytheistic, meaning they believed in various different gods. But that actually is an important point, too. And the, the Catechism talks about this. St. Paul talks about this in Romans, right, how it's what that shows is that it's natural for a human being to have a religious desire 
like it's a natural part of human beings because every single culture in the world there's never a culture that was like atheistic from the beginning like you know like like an ancient culture like let's say you know if you go to the polynesian islands or, or you know china and india or if you go to you know the new world you know what we call the new world or greece like everybody all of them had these ancient peoples had an idea about gods and, and religion and something even if it obviously is very different than what ends up being revealed obviously through the bible um, they still had a belief in these things so once the gospel comes to them like once the gospel came to the colossians they had very different ideas about gods but they still had a religious belief and so when they hear the gospel they're like oh this is the this is what it what truly we're being led towards so um, but yeah most of their myths were things that they came up with over time and passed down and um, about how they're how they came into being and they and they you know they associated just the natural world with like with God almost, right? You know, like thunderstorms or, you know, natural disasters or beautiful, you know, volcanoes or, you know, animals, like things that w for them were sort of like semi-divine almost. Even some of their of, of God, right? Yes. Yeah, that, that was um, also a very common thing in the ancient world, especially in like more of in the Eastern, what we call the Eastern culture. So like places like Egypt and, you know, what's now the Middle East, that had ideas of their kings or their pharaohs being divine and even referring to them as sons of God, right? So even the, the Roman emperor, originally the emperor in Rome wasn't considered divine, but as the Roman Empire grew and then right around the time when Christ comes, the emperor was believed to be divi a divine figure and also was referred to as the son of God. So again, that shows you why it was so powerful for Jesus now to come and say, I'm the, the son of God, right? You know, and uh, not the, and even though Jesus was, you know, born in Bethlehem in a manger and Augustus Caesar was like, you know, the ruler of the entire world, you know, so it looks very clearly, it looks like Augustus was the son of God, but really it was Jesus, right? So, but yeah, so these are all the good points about how in these cultures, there was this idea of religion. They, they had this idea in different gods and everything, but it was very different. Like Paul is kind of stressing and the hymn is stressing here. There's only one God, like Larry was saying, there's only one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. And through God, everything in the world, either visible or invisible, was created through Christ. So that's a, that would be, again, for us, I don't think that that's really that interesting. I mean, it's interesting. It's definitely interesting. But it's not that, like, revolutionary because we just kind of know that. Like, we're living in a Judeo-Christian kind of world where most people just believe in, you know, even if they don't really, they're not really that religious, they kind of believe in God and they kind of believe that everything was created through God. But that would have been, at this time, when these Christians were going around to bring the faith, it would have been very revolutionary. Did you want to say something, Larry? Well, it's just, uh, um, you mentioned the word revealed earlier. Mm. And that, uh, in a sense, my understanding, so the, the Gentiles sometimes get a bad rap mm. because they were just cultures. The gods and how they viewed the world, they were trying to ask the same questions we ask of ourselves even in this day. Mm -hmm. Why am I here? How does this happen? What makes a thunderstorm? What makes it rain? Mm -hmm. So it was just a search to find answers to those yeah. questions. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the gospel reveals Jesus Christ mm -hmm. that that it makes the understanding that we have. And that's why the Father said the Gentiles could, they had an idea of what a religion was. They had an idea of what, so if they, if they came to know God and Jesus, you know, God through creation, well, they, that made sense to them. It wasn't a foreign idea, but but their culture was just trying to answer questions exactly. that all humanity tries to yeah. answer. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, why it took such a long time for this, this is an agnostical opinion. Uh, mm. Why for such a long time did they follow this belief of all these different gods? So say, for instance, like I'm thinking, um, you know, they had a God for harvesting. Mm -hmm. So, if the harvest didn't come through, mm. they, when you pray to that God, what did you do? Yeah. You, well, then, believe in that God? Yeah. But in a sense, they would they would come to the conclusion, we did something wrong. Yeah. The God wasn't being kind to us, or the God didn't answer our yeah. prayers, or he didn't reward us. And in a sense, just like we have the tradition of the church that's been passed on, mm -hmm. The pagans had traditions that were passed on for generation mm -hmm. to generation. Mm -hmm. So, in that way, we're similar, but, you know, obviously very, very similar. Yeah. To your point, too, Sharon, I was just reading about this actually yesterday, because I 
read about these crazy things that nobody else would be finding. I was reading about Aztec religion. I don't know why. So, and because um, I was interested in these things about you know, it's so fascinating, right? They have this religion for thousands of years, and then obviously the Spanish come with Catholicism, and they end up many of them end up you know converting very quickly. And one of the things that one of these what I was reading pointed to was. So, for instance, they had a god of war. The Aztecs had a god of war, a pagan god of war. And they had lost in battle, this particular Aztec city had lost in battle so many times that they actually, you know, first of all, they thought they had done something wrong, right? They had to appease the god more to, to you know, more sacrifice or whatever to try to, to win more. But eventually that actually led them to believe that the Christian god was actually the real god because they were losing in war. And so they said, this warrior god of ours is, must not be real or, or true. And so that led them to see, you know, and, and some of this wasn't always probably the best reasoning, but they were seeing these Spanish people have all these weapons and everything. They seem to be doing well, right? So they, they kind of migrated towards that. But so, yeah, I think in some of it too, yeah, definitely they could see that a lot of it was kind of futile at times, right? Um, like it, there wasn't, they weren't being helped, right? Um, and so that kind of might have led them to, you know, the Christian faith, for instance, or it would have led them just to say, let's offer more sacrifices, right? Let's, you know, do more to try to um, appease the God. Because most of these cultures, they were, they didn't really have like, like we talk about like a relationship with God, like God is a, is a personal reality that we have a relationship to. That really didn't exist so much. It was more your relationship with the gods was just essentially appeasing them by offering sacrifices or doing things to, to gain their favor. Um, but it wasn't like you were entering into a relationship with like Apollo or something like that, you know, it's a different kind of reality. So, um, so that's another thing that, again, like Larry saying difference of, of the, Jane, I think you wanted to say something a couple of times. Yeah. yeah. I think for the past several decades, when I was taking in the anthropology or sociology classes, they were read was the origins. Mm. And it was like the origins of the, the different cultures all around the world believe. And the main thing that I remember from that book is how much of a similarity they were. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, this is, again, something that the Catechism it talks about so much, but it's so true. It's, it says the human being has a religious instinct. Like, in our hearts, we have a religious instinct. It's, you know, people today will try to tell you that religion is like an imposition and it doesn't make sense and it's not something that comes from us, it's something that's imposed on us. But no, it's like reality tells us that it's something that's just ingrained. Like we just have an instinct to want to know the big questions. Like Larry was saying, we want to know who is, you know, how did we get here? What's the meaning of life? All these questions. These are not, you know, again, there's people who would tell you today, those are questions that are not good questions. They're, you shouldn't even ask those questions. They're not important or whatever. Those are the, the major questions that every culture has asked. And the answers are always something something about God or something about faith or something about religion, right? And um, even if, again, they're not necessarily getting everything right, as we would understand it, there's still that instinct there that has to be. No, no, go for it, Joyce, yeah. Um, yeah, to your point, um, when, well, when God is not in the picture in the, first, in the culture's life, mm -hmm. something else steps in. Yeah. Government, Satan. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we need to have a God. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, there's always people talk about, I said this in the homily recently, you know, the God, we have a God shaped hole in our hearts. That's what people say a lot of times, meaning we have to make something a God, right? If we don't make God our God, then we're going to make something our God. It's going to be government or it's going to be something, or I think we have a couple. Yeah, did, did you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, no, no problem. Yeah. Um, 
similar to the God. So I was just wondering if that might be something that he instilled in each human originally just to that type of thing. Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. And I, I, I want to, there's many ways to answer that, but I want to answer it by going to what St. Paul says. So this is a, one of the major passages from St. Paul. This is actually where the church gets basically our teaching about this very subject, which is essentially, you know, the, the teaching of the church is essentially that human beings, s simply based on the fact that we have reason and that we exist, even if we never encounter the church or we never encounter the Bible, which many th millions of people never did, right? Billions of people probably. Even if we never encounter the church, never encounter the Bible, just by being a human being and by having reason, we can come to the conclusion that there is some, some God that exists simply based on the fact that, you know, again, by reason, and this, every culture really has done this, right? You, you come to see reality. You see the beauty of creation. You see things like love. You experience love or, you know, these things that are, you know, like I think we all have, or music or something like this, and you come to these realizations that this is not simply just, you know, something that's just created by human beings, right? There's something more to reality than just what... Um, than what we perceive, right? Um, so this comes from St. Paul. So this is from Romans. So if you turn all the way back to Romans is the first letter of St. Paul that's, that's listed in the scripture. So it's right after Acts. So if you go turn backwards to where uh, the gospels are, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then there's Acts. And then right after Acts is Romans. And it's right at the beginning of Romans chapter one. Romans is like you know, it's a letter, but it's also like, we've talked about this, it's like a theological treatise. It's very long, and it has all these major theological points that Paul draws out, and that also become really important for the history of, of theology. So we're in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse um, 18 and onward. So really 19 is what's going to be important for us, but so I'll just read it. So verse, verse 18 first. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men, who by their wickedness suppress the truth. This is the really important verse, so verse 19. So verse 18, and now we're on verse 19 of chapter 1 in Romans. So this is the big important verse. For what can be known about God is plain to them. So again, he's talking about just people that exist, you know, even apart from the gospel. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, this is verse 20, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man or birds or animals or reptiles. So this is a really interesting passage here. Paul's drawing all this together. He's saying basically, and Paul is, you know, Paul likes to be a little bit more forceful here. So he's saying this in a language that's more forceful than what we're saying. What he's basically saying is human beings don't have an excuse, right? Even if you, even if you never heard the gospel, right, which many people never did, he's saying you still don't have an excuse not to believe that there is some kind of God, that there is some kind of force, some kind of reality. And then he, at the end, starts turning against the, the polytheistic religions, right? And he's saying um, ultimately... The, the worship of idols, right, when they're worshiping, like, images of animals, like, like wooden idols or golden idols or stone idols, right? He's saying that's ultimately kind of they started in a good place, right? They, they started in a good place of saying there's some kind of reality here that's farther than our understanding. There's some kind of God. There's some kind of thing, right? And then they, but they ended up in a, in a place of saying, oh, that God must be an animal or must be a piece of stone or must be a piece of wood, right, which he would say and we would say, too, is obviously a wrong way of um, – but basically, the important thing here is, again, verse 19 and 20, is he's saying, um, the, since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. So notice he says clearly perceived, not just like, oh, we can kind of get a little sense of this. He's like, no, it's clearly perceived that if you just look at the created things, right? So if you look at the world, then any person with reason should be able to say, this is not something that could have been just, could just exist, right? That there must be a creator. So he's basically saying creation leads people to believe that there is a creator, right? Just looking at the reality. So. I, it's so weird because I happen to watch um, Father Gorin, who's um, in prison, he's teaching this, but he was saying that the Bible tells us 
I forget where in the Bible, that you're to look at the birds and the flowers, like you're supposed to do that. I forget where he's half or he's half a tree. Mm-hmm. And it kind of makes sense then that in how important nature is then in how you live here. Yeah. It helps you kind of reflect more about God. Yes. And that maybe that fly in the Bible is telling us to look to nature. Exactly. Oh, nice. And um, she, she was out evangelizing, you know, trying to evangelize, and she said it's very hard. The one person that she was talking to said, well, I can't believe there's something that I can't see. Mm. And I said, well, just have them look at the trees and the leaves and the sky and the clouds. Like, how'd that get there? Exactly. Like, God reveals himself right in creation. Yeah. Like, or, and that's pretty much the same way. Like, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, both of those points are excellent, which is that, yeah, the scriptures tell us, but also just our Christian faith tells us to... Uh, and Pope Francis obviously is very big on this too, right? And the, the tradition of the church has been big on this. Like the beauty of nature, the beauty of creation, why that's so important um, is it shows us that God exists, right? It shows us the beauty of what God has created. But always, and this is what Paul is saying here, right? We never want to go down the side of worshiping creation, right? This is what the pagans did, the pagan polytheistic religions, is they, they were so amazed by the creation that, as he says in verse 22, they ended up like worshiping it as God. Now, this also exists today, too. And Pope Francis talks about this. Um, it's one thing to be environmental, right? Meaning to want to, you know, save creation and want to, you know, cherish creation. But it's another thing to, Pope Francis talks about in some of his encyclicals, there's some strains of like environmentalism where they start to kind of like worship creation. It's almost like, an, like a paganism coming back where it's like there really isn't a God, but it's really just like, the world is sort of God. And, you know, people talk about the universe, right? People always say, oh, the universe kind of told me or the universe did that because they don't want to say God. But what that is, is it's basically like it's making the world creation into God, right? Which is, again, what Paul is saying is what we're not supposed to do, right? Because creation before the creator. Exactly, exactly. In the Romans that we were just reading, mm-hmm. in verse 25, mm-hmm. that they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and revered and worshiped the creature rather than the creator. Exactly. Yeah, this passage is, is hugely <coughs> meaningful. It's very difficult passage, too, because when you read it, you're like, wow, this is really true, <laughs> like, now. Like, so he talks all about what's going to happen. And it's, so it's amazing that Paul can just, you know, obviously he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's just sitting down writing a letter, and in the first chapter of the letter, he's just writing, like, a whole thing about this is what's going to happen when people, you know, move away from the creator and towards creation, right? And it's, it's all true, right? He talks about some pretty dark things here, right, that are going to happen, but it's, it's what happens in every, you know, every, in every age, right, whenever we replace the creator with creation or with something that we're an idol, basically, which just means something that is created that we're worshiping as God. So, um, but this is, this is the teaching of the church going back to verse 18 and 19 and 20 here of chapter one is that, again, any human being, if you were just like, you know, even if, like, let's say if you were an alien that was dropped on the planet and you had reason, right, you were able to reason, and you never knew that, like, God existed or you never knew about the Bible, you never knew about the church, but you're looking around at what exists, that that alien would be able to say, okay, there's, he would be able to clearly perceive, as Paul says, from the things that he's seeing that there's something, there's a creator, there's something more here than just, you know, whatever, that it's just like whatever other people believe, that it's just existed from all time or that it's just a random, you know, occurrence or whatever. Because as Satan is chaos and God is organized and everything works symbiotically and in harmony and not even just this or just this, but the whole package is just, it it can't happen by circumstance. Yeah. Happenstance. Yeah. Think about like the laws of physics. It all works together. Yeah. yeah, that like that life exists. You know, I mean, obviously I'm not a physicist, so we just had a, we have a lot of you know very educated people in our community from Yale, and many of them are scientists. In our RCA program, we have people that are biomedical and physical physics and all that. And so I like to ask them because they could tell you, oh yeah, if you look at all the constants and this and that, it's like this tiny little chance that life could exist. But of course it does, right? So it shows you that. The fine-tuning, like they like to say, of, of the universe, um, which ancient people didn't know about, right? They didn't know that, obviously, because they didn't have all these scientific disciplines that we have now, but they could sense it, right? There's something about, it's like, and th- maybe this would be something to 
you know, we, this is great. We're, once again, we're spending a half hour on one verse, which is good. We should do this. But I want to open it up to see, like, more of a testimony thing. Like, have you ever had an experience where, which I've had many times, but have you had an experience in your life where you say to yourself, like, you know, maybe it could be an experience of love. It could be an experience of, you know, human emotion. It could be seeing a mountaintop or something like that or seeing something in the world. Like, have you had an experience where you very clearly were like, this happened to you where you're like, you look at like what, what Paul's saying, where you see the created things and you're like, wow, like, or you hear a musical. That's, that's one for me. That would be my example is like, I, I love classical music. And if you go to a performance of like a Bach concerto or something, you're sitting there and you're like, this is, come on, like, this is just some random noises that are sounding really cool. It's like, there's something more to, to this, but I'm sure everybody has probably had experiences like that in life at some point. Yeah. I'm from Long Island originally, and I've known a number of physicists from the, the, from the Brookhaven Labs and Stony Brook, and they're either way. They're either mm. completely fully in God or they're completely not. Mm. It's really funny. Well, I don't know how they talk to each other, but yeah. they're completely separate. So yeah. I was looking at a video of some scientists before starting to realize that uh, because creation has an order to it, there must be a, 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 a creator behind it because there's order to everything that's created. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Is there a group, I forget what it's called, but <clears throat> where they scientifically take things that God has created and they show, like a bee, I guess they show scientifically how there's no way possible that it could be able to do the things that it does. Mm. They take different parts of nature and they show that I have anybody said something from me? Creation is not, I think it's the one, but yeah. yeah. There's a designer behind creation. Yeah. Like that. yeah. yeah. It's so fascinating. So when I was studying in anatomy, it was so interesting, like, all right, so I had a sister teaching us. Mm. Um, so I don't remember if she said this or if this just came to me, but I just remember, why do we have eyebrows? Mm. <laughs> why are they placed, the questions why are they placed <laughs> where they're placed and why do they brush off to the side because we're meant to work and the sweat drips down and doesn't get in our eyes mm. okay. it's supposed to just reflect the, the, the sweat right but who would think of that yeah <laughs> It's perfect for. Sermon, yeah. <laughs> it's very, yeah. That's from Sister Charles Marie. That's great. That's great. Yeah. That's so nice. Did he say the doctor? He was the runner before the doctor. Oh, wow. That's a great. Yeah. She was smart. Yeah. That's amazing. Did you want to say something, Sophia? Yeah. I just watched a little bumblebee going through the flowers. Mm -hmm. And I love the bumblebees because she's a little plump. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a little, little basket. Mm -hmm. Maybe people call and then they and then you start coming and oh, so I just I enjoy that so much. Yeah. <laughs> and then when the astronauts and the first time yeah. I saw the planet yeah. Yeah. resembling all that water. That's a great point. And I was just stunned. And my father he had the telescope and he tried to show me the saddle and the you know, all that stuff. he was really into that. And And you try to see the, the man on the moon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then the three astronauts, one heard him, he had the uh, Quran verse, and the other heard, heard, uh, heard um, uh, hear the song maybe of, of um, Mozart. Or mm. And they all three heard suddenly when they saw the real man. How God made it happen that he actually mm -hmm. this all happened and that he had used that how God with him you say he did almost the impossible mm -hmm. like that he go to the moon mm -hmm. he do greater things he that he can do but it's all God is made it possible mm -hmm. so wonderful exactly yeah the planets and the solar system yeah that's another one where it's like whoa <laughs> it's amazing planets, yeah it seems like they have no color but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's light. Yeah. 
Did you, Larry? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. So it's funny we're talking about bumblebees. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really is because so on the side of our deck at home, we planted sunflowers. We've always wanted to have sunflowers. Mm -hmm. We've never planted them, and they were amazing. They got like above the deck, ten feet tall. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting there, and all the bees really like sunflowers, so they're pollinating and stuff. And the oh, and, and it just came to me that morning, the exalted at the Easter mm. vigil. Yes. Right, they talk about God and the bees buzzing and the bees make the west. Mm -hmm. How God's plan, as chaotic as it may seem to us, mm -hmm. there's a net, it fits together. Yeah. And it's all, so I just thought of the exalted, you know, just yeah. sitting there on a Saturday morning watching the bees yeah. do their thing. So, yeah. You know, God can reveal himself in little glimpses that you yeah. hardly would have ever expected. Yeah. That's why we have to be close to nature and observing that. Yeah. 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 And you see the beautiful flowers and some things that they only bloom one day mm. or one evening or something mm -hmm. like that. And they are, they're just so gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Who could have done that? Mm -hmm. I think the uh, funny line of what came first, the chicken or the egg? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, but then if you said the egg, well, who made the egg? Yeah. If you said the chicken, who made the chicken? I mean, something has to have made it to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. When yeah. St. Augustine was the, the, wrote about the divine creator, mm. things have to come from, so, you know, that's the whole mm -hmm. philosophical yeah. and theological yeah. thinking is, mm -hmm. you know, you can play that game with everyone, you know, where did the stars go? Well, we have this. Yeah. Okay, well yeah. then who made this? Yeah. Yeah. Who did this? Exactly. Where did this come from? Yeah. Yeah. It has to be yeah. a divine creator yeah. and a divine. Yeah, the Greeks got there, people probably know this for you know, from studying philosophy, maybe like, you know, so you had millennia of, you know, if you think about just the Greeks, right, they believed, you know, like Paul was saying, first they started with all the various gods, you know, the polytheistic gods, Apollo and all these Aphrodite and everything. Then their philosophers, people like Plato, you know, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, those are the three big ones. They each, you know, went in order for Socrates and Plato, Aristotle. And over time, the philosophers are the people who were basically the smartest people in their whole culture that had taken all the wisdom from like centuries and put it all together they started to come to the idea that there has to be you know because again the the most of the polytheistic religions believe that matter just creation just existed for eternity that it never was created it just has always existed and these philosophers started to believe that that couldn't be the case right there had to be something there had to be something that started this and so aristotle and one of his works, you know, again, one of the smartest people in that whole culture, the Greek culture, and obviously this is before, you know, Christianity and everything, he started to, to write about this, and he, and he basically came to the conclusion that there had to be something that, that started the whole chain, and he's called it the unmoved mover. So, like, everything moves, and there had to be some unmoved thing that first started all these things in motion, right? And so he wasn't calling this God, right? But basically it was like Aristotle's God was like, there had to be something that started this whole thing. And that's kind of what Paul is saying, that even with reason, right? It might take a while and it might be only the smartest of the smart that are going to come to this conclusion. But basically, you know, you're going to believe that there is something that's behind all this that started all this. So this, this like beautiful creations that people might point to, whether it be a piece of art, But the problem with, I mean, and, and often when it's beautiful, you know that that person has been given talent, mm -hmm. like a gift of that, so they mm -hmm. can be inspired. Sometimes it's used the wrong way, mm -hmm. but then often people also who don't worship God will worship that artist or that yeah. architect or that. Well, I'm bound to the object as a beautiful Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, the famous gospel singer, yeah. Matthew Tony, this famous gospel singer who grew up like a Baptist or whatever, and now she's worshiping Beyonce. Wow. Bowing down to her. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Who was the one who was doing this worshiping? I don't know the gospel singer's name, but and she's worshiping Beyonce. Beyonce has a church. And, honor of her. and that's exactly what Paul is saying here. Verse 20, verse 23, like I've said this before, you know, we always say, oh, like we don't have idol worship today because we don't have like people aren't worshiping like wood and stone. It's like we totally do. We have people that are worshiping people or 
Money. Think, exactly. Money. Exactly. Money. Exactly. 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 Chemtrails in the sky would really make me angry. And then people show pictures of these beautiful sunsets. I'm like, but that's that's only because of the aluminum particles in the sky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it just that upsets me. Yeah. I like seeing big fluffy clouds. That makes me happy because then I know they're natural. Mm -hmm. I don't like seeing not natural. Mm -hmm. In the sky, nobody should be touching the sky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it goes back to what you were saying, what Joyce was saying about how you know, when we, you know, everybody, no matter who you are, we all recognize when something is beautiful, when something is amazing. But then the problem is sometimes we don't put, you know, we don't, you know, credit the right source, right? We credit maybe one of the sources, right? We say, oh, it's this artist who did everything, right? Rather than say, well, no, it's, it's God who is in some way working through this person or God who's given this person gifts or, you know, whatever the case may be. Or we, we worship the the phenomenon we worship the mountain rather than with worshiping the god who created it right so um and it seems like that's very much a case in our culture today right about people that are putting placing that kind of worship in the creature rather than in the creator and all of that was foreseen by saint paul <laughs> yeah sure So it's like, how could God be just God? Like, how could there have been just God and not say? Um, did they ever, you know, talk about what they thought about that? These other philosophers and everything, you mean? Uh, in, even in our own catechism. Yeah, like what, what the place is of those people who never got to know the full Christian religion, you mean? or Like, I don't understand, and maybe it's because we're brought, we're taught there's always something that comes before. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah. So God created everything, but who created God? Oh yeah. So for me, like when I was little, I remember that being terrifying to me. Yeah. <laughs> Even now, I don't like to think about it because it doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. So, what is our faith teacher, the philosopher, to be just that point of view of who created God? Yeah. So yeah. So that basically is. So we define God as. Um, like this hymn is saying, the ground of all existence, the ground of all being, meaning he's the he's not only the cause but the explanation for everything that is. So by that very definition, there doesn't need to be something that explains God. In the same way that Aristotle, when he's saying that God is the unmoved mover, it means he is like the ground and cause of all existence and all being. So therefore, he is the explanation for everything. You know, um, so there has to be kind of to your point, and this is what Aristotle saw. And this is what people today see. You can't have just a chain that keeps going and going. There has to be at some point something that starts the chain, that causes the chain, that explains the chain. Because if, it, if it's not, then you just have an, an eternal chain that's going. And, and how do you have, how does that, that doesn't make any sense, right, logically. So God then for us is the explanation, the cause, the ground of it. He is what exists that explains everything else in reality. Um, and so various cultures can come to that same conclusion they might not call it god like aristotle didn't call this god but he did have a concept of saying he can't he reasoned to this himself he reasoned to this and said there has to be something outside of the chain of events and existence that explains all of it right and um and for us that is not just a concept right it's a it's a personal reality god is some is a is a someone that uh, you know a, a someone not just a something that has relation you can we can relate to and everything so it's not it's just like this amorphous kind of principle that exists there's a lot of people that want to yeah i have to say the very exact same question to my priest i think it was in the second or third grade mm -hmm. but i explained it to my son who was asking about you know the seven days and the you know creation and everything and he's like i'm not sure i believe all this stuff this is scientific mm -hmm. he's like, well look at it this way i said we're very linear thinking very temporal thinking i said god is Quantum. Oh, okay. Mm. That's it. Mm. That was his answer. Mm -hmm. Quantum. 
<laughs> well, that actually is it. So there, I was talking with somebody who, one of the Yale students who's into physics and uh, was talking about um, basically, you know, I don't know all this, you know, I know it very, very vaguely, but about like sort of quantum physics, which is like sort of this new, you know, kind of um, era in physics. And th a lot of it comes down to, he was saying, um, mystery. Like there's certain principles where we've discovered that at the at the very very most basic level of just particles and reality, there's things that we can't explain. Like there's things that almost don't make sense logically. Like two particles could be in the same place, or they could be you know whatever. And so he was saying like this could even for a person of faith, you could see here like this shows us that there is something that we can't really explain at the basis of all, and that could explain why you know, how, how something could have been created in the first place, right? Or how God could work miracles, for instance, right? So there's, there's so much more to it than just, you know, um, than we might, might, might think, yeah. yeah. I'm going to talk, but then we can talk at some point here, too. Oh, welcome. <laughs> Yeah. For six thousand years, and I was wondering if that's what Catholics believe, or do they believe in the dinosaur age and millions of years? That's a great question. So there's no, um, there has never been from the church an official pronouncement on that matter. Now, if you go back to the early father, so I was I studied the the fathers of the church or the early fathers. Even the early fathers, when they read Genesis one, you know, the days of creation, like Augustine, for instance, who was mentioned, who was one of the great fathers in our faith, right? They didn't understand it as you know. A 24-hour day, um, partly because if you look at the Hebrew, right, the word yom day doesn't necessarily mean just a 24-hour day, right? So, um, in many ways, some of those, some of that interpretation that you were just talking about, some of the more Protestant interpretation today, a lot of that is actually more of a recent development in theology, right? In the last couple hundred years, but that's recent in, in the grand scheme of thousands of years, right? So, even the early Christians, right? Uh, pope Benedict had a great book on this before he became pope about like what the early Christians believed about this. And he, he shows that, you know, many of the early fathers didn't, they didn't understand it as meaning again, like seven 24 hour days, right? Um, so they understood it as meaning ages, right? Um, but if you look at, you know, the order in which it takes place, again, if you look at what physicists say about how, you know, like for instance, light being, you know, because people say, oh, how the plants exist, but the light exists before, and how does that make any, you know? A lot of it actually follows what what physicists would understand would be you know how light is the first reality that comes into existence right which again doesn't just mean like light that like we understand it but just this principle of of um being and 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 force right um so so the short answer is catholics are not held to and the catechists talk about this very clearly we're not there's no like uh you know definitive pronouncement uh, ex cathedra pronouncement on you have to believe in the theory of evolution or you have to believe in creationism or whatever. You, you're free to believe in either. Um, and Pope, Pope John Paul uh, had an, an encyclical speaking about this, how um, you know, a Catholic could, in, in, in good conscience, um, believe in something, something similar to, like, so for instance, the theory of evolution, with certain caveats, right? We have to hold that there is, you know, as Genesis talks about, a creator, right? There is a creator who created all things, right? Because there's some evolutionary theories that wouldn't believe in a creator, that it just kind of all happened, right? Um, we also have to believe that it is God who is the one who's designing through this, right? That basically, like, uh, evolution from that point of view would be God's plan for bringing about all of this, this reality, right? Um, but you could also, um, in good conscience, believe in something more similar to, like, intelligent design, um, or creationism, where um, this idea that um, basically there wasn't this kind of evolutionary theory that was happening, but it was more God, like directly doing things, you know, one after the other to, to kind of bring about creation. So, so Catholics are free to believe. Um, actually, I can even bring up to you the catechism, what the catechism says, so I can say it in the exact words. But any other questions on that, or because that's a that's a great question. Yeah. And that's the thing, and that's the thing with evolution is, you know, obviously there's there's a lot of it can you know 
explain a lot, but there's also things that, you know, seem to not make sense, right? Based on, based on... Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one one kind of um, you can probably find a lot of this if you you know if you if you dig deep you can find a lot of this stuff. But um, you know, there are some Catholics who talk about how you know you, it's almost like a sort of a combination of the both in a certain sense, right? There's elements in which things about the evolutionary theory could could make sense in the sense of you know different species developing from other species or, and all that kind of thing. But also hold that together with the fact that God, at certain points, God is clearly doing something that's not necessarily just exactly what would be expected as the natural progression for this, but something sort of like miraculous happening to create certain things or certain species, right? Um, which is what we believe about God, right? That God is free, obviously, to um, you know to do that if he if he desires. So, yeah, go ahead, Sylvia. Yeah, that's a lot of good things you brought up there. I would say thank you for bringing it up. So she just read from John chapter 1, the very beginning of the Gospel of John, which is one of the most important parts of all the scriptures. But John, so this is, I could spend a whole two hours talking about this, but so read this on your own. But one thing that maybe is good to go and do as we go home is read Genesis 1, which is obviously in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, you know, and the, and the seven days and all that kind of thing. And then read John chapter 1. 
which says, in the beginning was the word, the word of God. So John, what John was doing very clearly is he was referencing, as, as he's beginning his gospel, he's like, how am I going to begin my gospel, right? How am I going to start this, you know? And so he references Genesis, right? So in the very first words of the Hebrew Bible are, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, you know, and the, and the earth is formless and, and void and all this goes on and on as we know. And so he's going to reference now, in when he's talking about the gospel, which talks about the role of Christ, Jesus Christ, he's saying, in the beginning, so everybody thinks immediately, oh, he's talking like Genesis, right? But he doesn't say, in the beginning, God created. He's, he's talking about actually even before that, like you're saying. He's saying, in the beginning, even before God created anything, the Word, which is the Son, was with God, and the Word was God, right? So this idea that, like the, like the Philippians hymn is saying, I mean, the Colossians hymn is saying that we just read, right? That before all things, there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit together, and together then they create all things. Through, through them all things are created. So, yeah. Well, with regard to the question that came up about the uh, length of days or the amount of time yes. under, uh, in which the creation uh, occurred, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the belief that the earth might be only 6,000 years old, one thing that I learned in a theology class way back was uh, something I'd never thought of before, that God was actually outside of time. You know, uh, uh, everything that has happened uh, since the world, or the solar system, for example, go back even further, was created, uh, is all in God's mind an eternal now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that also encompasses things that have not yet happened. Exactly. And uh, so uh, it, it makes the idea of, uh, of uh, uh, each of the days of creation being something akin to 10,000 years more, more understandable. Exactly. You know, and, exactly. And, uh, yeah, that's an excellent point um, that... Um, Basically, uh, you know, our notion of time obviously is it's it's contingent with creation. Meaning, time was created when God created creation, mm -hmm. right? So time did not exist mm -hmm. when in John one when it's talking about before everything else existed. That means there's no time. It's outside of time that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then when God creates, as we hear in Genesis one, then time also is created too. So yeah, our notion of time is um, is uh, you know, it's our notion. Yeah. <laughs> Any other points? I just wanted to say, I don't know if it's a good but I just wanted to thank you, Father, for having us, first of all, the Bible study and your listening, and also from everyone here, because I feel like sometimes there's things that we don't understand, and someone will just say something, mm. and then it's like things start to make sense, so almost like how God sets it up. And it, like, I don't know if he lets you hear when you're supposed to hear, or mm. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Yeah. And thank you, everybody, for being here for this is good discussion. We also got through one verse this time. <laughs> Let's give ourselves a pat on the back. Here to see how amazing these. But again, it's, it shows you. Um, I also just wanted to read a passage just based on what we were just talking about. So this is one of my favorite passages in Scripture that talks about the whole um, you know, thing about time. Um, where is it? First Peter four. Um, you probably heard this passage before about one with with the Lord. One one year, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Right. Um, so w this is Peter talking about the um, trying to get people talking about the coming of God at the, the coming of Jesus at the end of time. Right. And they're all nervous about when it's going to happen. And he's like, remember for the Lord. You know, a thousand years is as one day, and one day is as a thousand years. Basically, what that means is time doesn't mean anything to God, right? It's totally means nothing. So, uh, but yeah, that's that's a good example of kind of what you were just saying about how you know we can't get too we can't lock God into our own our own time. So, but thank you everybody for being here, and um, this is a good discussion on on that verse. So, um, uh, we'll get a degree when we're done. <laughs> exactly. Now you're going to have all this all this wisdom. So yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, that would mean I'd have to leave here. So, <laughs> and we got a couple times, a couple of comments, and we got Silvana commenting, Larry. She said, "Great afternoon, Father Joe and Deacon Larry. Thank you for everything you do for us. It's always nice to pray with you. May God bless you always." And then someone just agreed with the last comment, saying, "Thanks for expressing. Um, thank you. I express my gratitude for these Wednesday times emoji." So, all right, let's pray together. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
Lord, thank you for blessing us with this time together and for the knowledge and wisdom that you have given to us through your spirit. And we ask that you continue to do so, especially at times when we may feel uncertain and doubting, that you might give us the strength to continue to believe. And we give you thanks for the beauty of your creation, the beauty of all that we enjoy in this life that shows us how good you are and how great you are. And we ask that all the people of the world, especially people in our own community, people in our own families, friends of ours may come to also understand the beauty of you, the creator. May your blessing be upon all those who are watching us now and joining us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless everybody. Thank you. Thank you.